Thank you for joining us for the Victory Podcast today. Today's podcast is from March 24th, 2019. Join us as we continue our study in the Gospel of John with Pastor Dex. If you've been around the last several weeks, you know that we've been talking about heaven uh, around here lately out of this one verse in, in John 17, 24. And so uh, this is the last little sermon in this small series about heaven from John 17, 24. And then after this, we only have two sermons left in John 17, if you can believe that. I don't even know when we started John 17, but we're coming to the end. But we've been talking about heaven here for the last few weeks. Heaven is, what do you picture when you hear that word heaven? Heaven for most of us is what the Christian experience is when they die. It's our hope our future hope. And while that's true, heaven is also infinitely more than just that. Do you realize that in the Bible, heaven is presented as being in three different states, three different phases of heaven. So first of all, the Bible talks about heaven in an immediate state, that heaven is not just something for the future. Because in Jesus Christ, heaven has come down to us. And this is something that is, is all over Jesus' preaching and teaching, the immediacy of heaven. In fact, do you remember when John the Baptist uh, began preaching? He summarized his message like this. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's near. And then when Jesus started his public ministry, his message was exactly the same. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then later on, when when Jesus gathers up uh, those 72 disciples and he sends them out on one of the first ever missions trips, he told them exactly what to say. He defined the content of their message. He said, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So in one very real sense, heaven is here. Heaven is now. Heaven has come to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, the full experience of heaven is yet to come. Heaven is a a place where one day all Christians will go. But you have to understand that if you are a believer... The first fruits of heaven have already been extended to you in Jesus. So this isn't an either or kind of thing. This is a both and kind of thing. It it fits into the, uh, the theological category of already, but not yet. Because where Christ reigns is where heaven resides, right? And so for the believer, the life of God is already in your soul. In fact, if you remember back when we were in uh, verse 3 of John 17, we looked at verse 3 and we saw that eternal life isn't merely something that just starts in the future. Eternal life begins when you know God. It's, It's something that is already the present experience of everyone who believes in Jesus Christ. So a Christian is someone who will one day go to heaven but it's also true that a Christian is someone to whom heaven has already come. One uh, one Puritan writer said it this way, heaven must be in thee before thou can be in heaven. Heaven must first be in you before you can be in heaven. So this is called the immediate state of heaven, this first way of thinking about heaven. But there's a second state of our experience with heaven. And this is how we most often think about heaven, namely as the place where Christians go at the moment when they die. And this is called the intermediate state of heaven. So there's the immediate state. Now we're talking about the intermediate state, which is when you die, though your body remains here, at that very instant, your soul is immediately ushered into the presence of Jesus Christ. Paul says to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. So at the moment of death, the the Christian soul is immediately taken to heaven. 
not soul sleep, not purgatory, but directly into the presence of Jesus Christ. And in that moment, your soul is cleansed from all sin, from all unrighteousness, and it is made perfect and holy. You are in heaven. You are in the presence of Jesus Christ. And you are there just as sinless and as righteous as he is. Can you imagine that? But do you realize that, that even then, in that moment, you're still not experiencing heaven in its fullest and final sense? Because though you are there, you are there without your body. Listen to what Hebrews chapter 12 says. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. This is a picture of heaven. And to innumerable angels in festal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all. Now listen. And to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. This is the intermediate state of heaven. The, the body is decaying in the grave, but the spirit, the soul, is, is enjoying uh, the realities of paradise in the presence of Jesus Christ. But is God done with you at that point? No. Far from it, right? Because when God saves you, he saves all of you. And all of you includes your body. Your body is not a prison for your soul like the Greeks used to think of it. It's not just a, a husk that's meaningless. Your body is, is the vehicle that God has given to you through which your soul can express itself. And, and it's this is what defines the third and final state of heaven. When finally... There is a perfect reunion between your body and your soul. And that happens only on the last day, at the day of resurrection, when Christians will be given perfect, glorified, sinless bodies that correspond with perfect, glorified, sinless souls. That's when we will experience heaven in its fullest sense. Now, have you ever wondered what that body will be like? that glorified, perfected, sinless body. Paul thought that you might. So he wrote about it in 1 Corinthians 15. He asks the question. Well, he anticipates the question. He says, someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? And then he goes on later in the chapter here to say three very important things about our resurrected bodies. So first of all, uh, we're going to look at verses 42 and 43 real quick here of 1 Corinthians 15. First of all, we see that these resurrected bodies will be imperishable. Verse 42, so is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown, put into the grave, is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. So that means that your resurrection body will no longer be susceptible to aging to illness, to disease, to damage, to decay, even death. Your, your body will be imperishable, immortal. And then in verse 43, Paul continues to describe this resurrected body. He says, it is sown, again, placed in the grave like a seed. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. So our first bodies are sown in, in dishonor, planted in the grave as it were, uh, as, as bodies that are affected by the stain of sin. Dishonor. But our resurrected bodies will be raised up glorious. And then thirdly, he says these bodies will be powerful. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Now, I don't know exactly what all of that means. Because I've never seen an imperishable body resurrected in glorious power. The only reference point I have for that is the glorified body of Jesus Christ. He could be touched, but he could also disappear. He could eat, but he felt no pangs of hunger. 
He could walk with people on a road, but he was lifted up to heaven on a cloud. Now, will our resurrected bodies allow us to do all those kinds of things? I don't know. But I know that our resurrected bodies will arouse a sense of wonder and worship and imagination and delight because what was buried in the ground as a natural body will be raised up as an imperishable, glorious, and powerful body. Paul says in Philippians 3, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Another, another old dead guy said this about heaven. And if you've never read uh, Randy Alcorn's book on heaven, I would commend that book to you too as a, uh, a good one to get your brain thinking. But uh, Charles Hodge said this about heaven. Quote, it is probable that however high our expectations on this subject of heaven, they will fall short of the reality. For it does not yet appear, it is not revealed in experience or in hope what we shall be. He's saying we, we, we have no frame of reference to know what it's going to be like. He says, we may have new senses, new and greatly exalted capabilities of taking cognizance of external things. We might see and understand the world in a different way. Of apprehending their nature and of deriving knowledge and enjoyment from their wonders and their beauties. Then he speaks about our bodies. He says, instead of the slow and worrisome means of locomotion to which we are now confined, we may be able hereafter to pass with the velocity of light or of a thought itself from one part of the universe to another. Our power of vision, instead of being confined to a range of a few hundred yards, may far exceed that of the most powerful telescope. These expectations cannot be extravagant, for we are assured that eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of a man to conceive the things which God has prepared for those that love him. We can't even begin to imagine what this will be like. But we know that, at least this much, heaven in its final expression includes the perfection of our body and our soul for all of eternity. So if, imagine this, if in heaven, you and I both are going to be perfect in body and soul for all of eternity, can you even begin to think about what that place will be like when it's filled with people like that? Jonathan Edwards said, heaven will be a world of perfect and unending love. A world of perfect and unending love. And so last week we started asking this question, what is it that makes heaven heaven? And, and last time in the same verse, we looked at it for our answer and we said that on one hand, heaven is being in the immediate presence of Jesus Christ to behold his glory for all of eternity. Verse 24, can we get that up there on the screen? See that there, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory. Heaven is being in the immediate presence of Jesus Christ to see his glory for all of eternity. But then, notice in this verse that Jesus says something about this glory. He says, to see my glory that you, Father, have given me. And if you remember back when we were in verse 22, we talked about what that means, this glory that the Father gave to the Son. We don't have time to go over all of that again, but just to suffice it to say that as a result of Jesus' redemptive work, leaving the glories of heaven, taking on human flesh, living a perfectly sinless life, dying a substitutionary death on the cross, rising from the grave on the third day, and ascending back to the right hand of the Father. As a result of that redemptive work, he was given a glory 
by the Father. And the point is here, Jesus wants us to see that glory. But, but now notice the very last little bit there in verse 24. And look at what it is that Jesus appeals to here. What he appeals to to ensure that his father will hear and answer this request for heaven. He says, because, that's a very important word, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. That makes this verse absolutely incredible. And, and to help you see this, I want to just kind of walk back through it uh, in reverse here for a second, okay? So let's start at the end. The Father loved the Son before the foundation of the world. And because of that eternal love, the Father gave the Son glory. With me so far? And the Father gave the Son glory so that those people whom he had given to the Son would see that glory for all of eternity. Do you see it? This, this makes the entire purpose for bringing this group of people to heaven something that begins with and is rooted in the love that God the Father has for God the Son. So, so let's walk back through this here front ways. The Father brings believers to heaven so that they will eternally behold the glory of Jesus Christ. And why does the Father want people to eternally behold the glory of Jesus Christ? Because the Father has always loved the Son from before the foundation of the world. Sometimes people uh, balk at this idea, but, but the reality of what this verse teaches us is that your hope of heaven is not so much rooted in God's love for you, it's far deeper than that. Your hope for heaven is rooted in the love that God has for his son. He brings you to heaven because, the verse says, he loves his son. And, he desires that you be there with him in that place to behold the glory that he gave to the Son forever. Now that's good news for us because that makes the certainty of heaven that much surer for the believer. Because heaven now is not dependent on how good you do, how well be you behave, how committed you are, how much you love God, or even how much God loves you. It is rooted in how much God loves his own son. And what will change that? And he's loved him before the foundation of the world, before a single thing was ever called into existence. Before time began, the uncreated, self-existent, self-sustaining, triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, lived in perfect, harmonious companionship with one another. And God the Father loved God the Son perfectly and eternally. Heaven, as Edward said, was a world of perfect and unending love. And, and the point that I want to try to make is this that just because sin has, has stained and marred every corner of creation, that does not mean that God's perfect love has been affected in any way. There's still a place where perfect love reigns, and that place is heaven, and that is where Jesus would have his people be. If you remember, uh, if we go back one verse to verse 23, Jesus makes this uh, astounding claim here in verse 23. He says, I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, that is believers, even as you loved me. That the world may know that God has loved us in the same way that he has loved his son. That's what he's saying. 
And in that verse, in verse 23, if you remember, he's saying that one day the world is going to see God's people in perfect unity, and they will realize that very fact, that God loves his people in the same way that he loved his own son. And that will be an amazing revelation for the world in that day, but they won't be the only ones amazed. We will be amazed as well as our previously sinful and small and finite minds begin to perfectly understand and experience the love of God. We, we know that God loves us now, but we do not know it in any way close to the way that we will know it then in his presence in heaven. So what makes heaven heaven? The second answer to that question for today is heaven is the place where we will experience the full-orbed love of God for all of eternity. Heaven will be a place that is where every relationship that we have will be characterized by perfect, unending love. And now what I want to do for the rest of the time that we have here uh, is something I don't usually do, but I want, to, I want to move out from this verse a little bit just to think about some other parts of Scripture that speak to this topic of heaven and our relationships with God in heaven and our relationships with each other in heaven. We want to better understand this idea of, of what makes heaven heaven, and we're framing it that it will be a place where every relationship our relationship with God, our relationship with others there will be characterized by perfect, unending love. So, first of all, I want to go to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13 seems oddly placed. The first time you come across it, it is smack dab in the middle of two chapters that, uh, where Paul discusses spiritual gifts. Verse, chapter 12 and chapter 14. But in chapter 13, he says, love never ends. And in contrast with that never ending love, he says, as for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Now, what the perfect is in this verse, it's been the subject of great debate over the years. We're not going to get into all that, but the main point is Paul is saying here, don't get hung up on spiritual gifts. Don't allow your gifts to become a source of pride. Spiritual gifts are beneficial. They serve a purpose here and now, but at best, they are only temporary. They're not going to be needed in heaven. But long after all those things have passed away, they faded off the scene. One thing will continue to prevail, and that is the excellency of love. Now, that won't be anything different for God, right? God is the eternal, eternal unchangeable, inexhaustible fountain of love. His love for us will remain perfect and infinite just as, as it has always been. The difference will be we will never, ever, even for a second, doubt his love again. We will spend all of eternity discovering the, the infinite depth and height and breadth and length and width of God's love for us. And, and even more amazing than that, Think about this. In heaven, your love will be just as perfect and just as unending as God's love is for you. Think about that. Just, just think about all the things that God has done for you. Think of the blessings that he's poured out in your life. The grace that he displayed when he saved you. I mean, we could stop right there, right? That, that's enough to make you love him more than any other 
being that could ever exist. And to love anyone or anything above him would be the very definition of idolatry. But here's the heartbreaking reality for you and for me. Our love for God now, as it stands now, is at best inconsistent. Passion-filled at one point in time, apathetic at another. Lit on fire one day, cold as ice the next. But on that day when you enter into this world of perfect, unending love, never again will your heart experience doubt or apathy or complacency or coldness. On that day, your love for God will express itself in a way that you can only dream for it to express itself now in unending, sinless perfection. Heaven is the place where we will experience the full-orbed love of God for all of eternity. We will receive that love, and we will dispense that love. We will know his perfect love for us for all eternity, and we will display it back to him just as perfectly as we receive it. That's incredible to think about. So that helps us understand what our relationship in heaven with God will be like. Receiving perfect love, displaying perfect love back. What about our relationships with others in heaven? What will that be like? And what I want to do here briefly is just address a couple of common questions that come up when the subject of heaven is raised and how we will relate to other people there. One very common question is, uh, will we be able to recognize each other in heaven? And the answer is very simple. Of course we will. We will. Heaven's not going to change that. We don't, we don't become angels when we die and go to heaven. I hope you know that, right? People talk that way all the time. Oh, sorry he died. God must have needed another angel. And they mean well, right? But we, we have to do away with that kind of cartoonish idea that we're going to be transformed into little, you know, Cupid-like babies floating on clouds in heaven. That's not what heaven is. That's dumb, right? Who wants to do that? The Bible teaches that in the new heaven, and very importantly, on the new earth, we will have bodies, right? Imperishable, glorious, and powerful, but certainly bodies that will be identifiable. Paul says to the Thessalonians, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, those who are dead, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. And the rest of what he has to say links back to this idea of grieving. For, since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So what he's saying is, believer, go ahead and grieve when a Christian dies but not in the way that an unbeliever grieves. Why not? Because a day of reunion is coming. And then he goes on in 1 Thessalonians, he speaks about the trumpet sounding, he speaks about the dead in Christ rising first, and then he finishes when he says, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Now listen, here's the main point of this whole thing. This isn't about trying to figure out how the end times works. Here's the point, the last sentence. Therefore, encourage with one another with these words. The point of this passage is to encourage and comfort those who are grieving the death of Christians. Not just the knowledge that they're going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, but they're going to be with those other Christians that they've known and loved, but they've been separated from temporarily in death. So will we be able to recognize each other in heaven? Of course we will. How else could this be comforting and encouraging? And this is just me speculating here now, but I like to believe that we'll recognize everybody in heaven without any need for introduction. I don't think anybody will have to take me by the hand and say, come over here, I'd like to introduce you to the Apostle Paul. Or I'd like to meet you to meet Ruth. How can I say that? Well, do you remember 
on the Mount of Transfiguration, when, when Jesus' glory bursts forth there for a moment and Peter and James and John are up there with him. But it's not just Jesus alone. When they look, there's two other people right alongside him. And, and do you remember what Peter says? He starts just talking. And he says, if you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Now, had Peter ever met or seen Moses or Elijah? No, there's centuries between those people. And yet he was able to instantly recognize them perfectly. I don't know how that works. But I think that in heaven we will know each other perfectly, even those whom we've never met before. Here's another uh, common question, last one. Uh, what about our family relationships in heaven? Will they be the same? Will you still be close with your spouse? Or will you just bump into each other and say, oh yeah, I remember you. You used to be my wife. Have you seen the kids around anywhere? It would be nice if we're in eternity to be together for a moment. I mean, after all, if everyone's finally perfect, I'd like to see it just once. So I want to go to, to two passages here that shed some light on this question, because this is a difficult question for people, especially when uh, a believing spouse dies, and you're thinking about marriage and heaven, and how's this relationship change, and how's it going to be different, and how is that better? So the first place I want to go is 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7. And the words will be on the screen, but 1 Corinthians 7 in your Bibles there. And uh, the context of this is that, that Paul is, is talking about um, men and women learning to be content in whatever condition they're presently in. Be content in your circumstances is what he's saying. So we pick it up here in verse 27. And he says, are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. And then he says, from now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. Now, before you're tempted to make that your new life verse, guys, keep reading what he says here, okay? Let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. And now he explains why. For the present form of this world is passing away. So, so what's Paul saying here, if we can try to put this together? He's saying it's, it's a legitimate thing for a man and a woman to marry and to understand each other as God's good gift to each other. A gift of God's grace. But the point he's making here is don't allow good things, even your family, to become an excuse for not serving Jesus Christ. And the reason why, again, that he tells us is the present form of this world is passing away. Look at verse 32. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. He's saying, don't get so caught up in the world. Again, even the good things that the world has to offer so that it becomes an excuse not to serve Jesus. Because the present form of this world is passing away. And that includes, in this context, the state of marriage. Go to Matthew 22. And this is the last one, I promise. Matthew 22, uh, this is one of Jesus' uh, altercations that he gets into with the Sadducees. Uh, the Sadducees are this sort of liberal sect within Judaism. They deny anything supernatural, uh, like the resurrection, uh, the reality of angels, anything supernatural, they deny. And so uh, they're in this interaction with Jesus, and what they do is they try to raise this hypothetical scenario to, to catch Jesus in a trap. And so we pick it up in verse 23. 
The same day, Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection, and they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said, If a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Leveret marriage, right? We're familiar with that from the Old Testament, the handful of times we see it. That's in the law. Moses said that. And now, now here they lay the trap. Okay. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no children, left his wife to his brother. So too the second and the third, on down to the seventh. Here comes the punchline. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. I love Jesus' answer to this. You are wrong. Because you know neither the scriptures, which teach resurrection, nor the power of God, which enables resurrection. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Notice he doesn't say that they are angels in heaven. They don't become angels in heaven, but they will be like angels in the sense that they won't be married. Why will there be no marriage in heaven? We can answer that a a couple of different ways, but I think maybe the best way is to think about what the purpose of marriage is. What is the purpose of marriage? And Ephesians chapter 5 tells us the purpose of marriage, that it is to reflect the greater reality of the relationship between Christ and his church. A reality that, by the way, in heaven, we will be living out. We will be fully and finally experiencing that reality. Therefore, there will be no need for a picture to point to that reality. Therefore, there will be no need for marriage. And I know the objections. I love my spouse. I'm happily married. My my spouse is my closest companion, my best friend. I feel that way too. And that's good because if your spouse is a believer and you're a believer, you will enjoy a relationship with that person forever and ever. And think about it. If you cherish that relationship now, if that relationship means so much to you now while you're both still sinful, imagine what it will be like when you're both fully glorified. If you think it's good now, in heaven it will be unimaginably better. You're not going to be missing out on anything. To, to think that way is earthly. And we want to direct our thoughts heavenward. But not only are you going to enjoy that kind of relationship with your believing spouse, with your precious believing children, but you will enjoy that kind of close, intimate relationship like you've never had before with every other person who is there in heaven. That's the way it's going to be. You're not going to be losing out or missing out on anything. There will be only gain in heaven. Just think about that right now. Just think about even your closest relationships. And in heaven, there will be no more selfishness, no more impatience, insensitivity, harsh words, misunderstandings, hypocrisy, greed, mistrust, short tempers, gossip, strife, anger, hate, broken promises, slander, or insecurity. In place of all of that garbage, for all of eternity, there will be perfect joy and peace and bliss and communication and satisfaction in every single relationship with every single person who exists. Heaven will indeed be a place of perfect, unending love. And every single relationship will be characterized by that unending perfection. First John says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. We will be like him. 
which means we will finally love God perfectly and everlastingly. And for all of eternity, we will love one another perfectly and everlastingly too. Heaven is the place where we will experience the full orb love of God for all of eternity and where every relationship we have will be characterized by perfect, unending love. There's so much more we could say about heaven, but this is where we're going to leave it for now. Heaven will be a world of perfect and unending love. We would like to thank you for joining us for the Victory Podcast today. This podcast is a ministry of Victory Baptist Church in Hermiston, Oregon. You can find us at 193 East Main Street in Hermiston, Oregon, 97838, or on the web at yourvictory.org.